Hello everyone and welcome to Precision Digital's webinar, Loop Powered Devices, The Fundamentals. This webinar is designed to be a basic educational course for those of you who have to deal with Loop Powered Devices but aren't necessarily an expert. Precision Digital has done a series of educational webinars including sessions on temperature signals, understanding two, three, four wire signals, the fundamentals of pulse inputs, Modbus, reducing signal noise, and hazardous area classifications. These recordings are available on the Precision Digital website, predig.com. Now, a couple of things to get out of the way before we start this session. The webinar is available on predig.com in the webinar archive, and you will be sent a link on how to view it after the session. Also, Everyone in attendance today is in listen-only mode. You can't speak, but you are encouraged to ask questions via our chat box during the webinar. There will also be a couple of question and answer sessions during the, during the webinar where we, where we will pick some of those questions submitted to be answered. We are glad uh, that you can join us today. Uh, my name is Ryan Shea, and I'm, going in, uh, I'm a product specialist here at Precision Digital, and I will be your webinar moderator today. Don Miller is an application specialist with Precision Digital who often deals uh, with loop powered devices, and he is working behind the scenes answering your questions in the chat window. Our main speaker today is Joe Ryan. He is a product manager with Precision Digital and has over 10 years of experience in the field with all kinds of process signals. He works in design, support, manufacturing, and marketing of process instruments and controllers. He has a lot of knowledge he's going to share with us today. Don, Joe, and myself are broadcasting live from the, Pre from the Precision Digital headquarters in Holliston, Massachusetts. Joe, I think we're ready to get started. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, and thanks everybody for attending. Before we get too deep into the content here, why don't we review what our objectives and takeaways are going to be for today's webinar. The first takeaway is going to be understanding the critical criteria required for using a loop-powered device. In other words, what are the things you need to know if you're going to start looking at the specifications and setup of loop-powered devices? We also want you, to, want you to be able to decide if loop, power is the, if, if loop Power is the best choice for you and your application. Obviously, there's some big advantages to using Loop Power devices, but there are going to be times where it doesn't apply. And we want you to learn the conditions or application criteria that would define those areas where you would say, you know, this really isn't somewhere I want to be using a Loop Power device. I can probably save myself time and bypass that option entirely. So we want to talk about what you need to know to choose it, be able to recognize if it's the choice for you, and know what those criteria are going to be that make you disqualify it. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's take a look at today's agenda. We're going to define the characteristics of loop powered meters, um, both define the terms that you're going to be hearing when we talk about them, but also discuss a bit what the features and standard defining elements are of a loop powered device. We're going to talk about those critical specifications I spoke about a minute ago, uh, what those things are you need to be able to look at and understand to really be able to design this into your application solution. We want you to know when loop powered is your best choice, and we want you to know when loop powered is something you may want to avoid because it's going to limit you in some way in your application. But before we dive into that, Ryan, you had a question for the audience. Yes, yeah, so uh, we like to get to know everyone in the webinar and kind of see where everyone's from, what industry you're in, and how much you really know about um, how much you really know about loop power devices. So we're going to take a quick survey here. So if everyone could vote on where you're located, the Eastern U.S., Central U.S., Western Canada, or other, uh, and then it's really good to kind of take a look at see where everyone is is coming from. So what, if you guys just uh, take that really quick, and we'll skip to the results and see where everyone's, uh, see where everyone's coming from today. And it looks like mostly the Western U.S. and Central U.S. and uh, Canada and Eastern are close behind. Um, I'm wondering where people from other are from. So if you put that in the chat window, you'll be able to tell us uh, where, uh, where you're coming from as well. 
And then one more, or actually the, we have two more actually. Uh, what is your industry? So are you guys industrial distributors, manufacturing, pharmaceutical, public utility, petrochemical, HVAC? And we'll skip to the results in one minute. Just let everyone, give everyone a chance to, to vote on that. And it looks like mostly industrial distributors, which is people who I talk to mostly every day. Uh, and then it looks like manufacturing and public utility and consulting engineering um, are coming in second. And then one more, so what is your level of expertise with loop power devices? Uh, we'd like to see where everyone is coming from, where everyone's at, uh, and kind of helps us gauge uh, what, what things to cover as well. So are you a seasoned expert, an electrical engineer, know enough to get the job done, uh, looking to learn more, or do you have zero experience? We will skip to that right now. So it looks like mostly everyone, Joe, knows just enough to get the job done, which is good. This is it good for this webinar? That's, uh, that's not a surprising answer. We get a lot of that at mm -hmm. these webinars. People just learn essentially enough to get them by and in order to get their equipment installed. But sometimes they come to things like this just to get a little refresher or a more detailed explanation, and hopefully we'll provide that for you. That's right. Now I think we are ready to move on, Joe. We'll have some more questions down the line along with uh, question and answer sessions. Great. Thanks, Ryan. So the first question we've really got to answer if we're going to talk about the fundamentals of loop-powered devices is what is a loop-powered device? So a loop-powered device gets its power from the system that it's connected to. It reads the signal and is powered by that same signal line. There is no external power supply needed. And because of that, you often hear of these loop power devices referred to as two-wire devices. And that's essentially the same thing. If you hear someone say, well, is that a two-wire device? Really what they're saying is, is that a loop power device? Because the same wires that carry the signal in are the same two wires that are carrying the power that the device uses to operate. Now to give you an example of that, we show a wiring setup for our PD6870 explosion proof loop power display. And you can see that I've got my power supply on the left. That two wire setup brings it through my 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter and into my meter. And then that same wire that comes out and goes back to my power supply is part of that transmitter loop and my power supply loop. It's all one big loop, it's two wires, and it's both my 4 to 20 milliamp signal and it's my power supply. On the left, on the right rather, you'll see it set up in more of a uh, graphical system where someone is using a, probably in this case, a temperature transmitter here. They've got the sensor down at the bottom. But then that's going to transfer it to a 4 to 20 milliamp loop and I've got the same thing. My power supply through my transmitter, through my controller of some kind, and back to my power supply. So the loop powered device really only needs those two wires in order to function. A loop powered device is always referring to the 4 to 20 milliamp current loop. That's what the loop is in the loop powered device. And what we've got here is just a really basic circuit diagram to kind of explain how these devices work. So when you're talking about voltage and current, the thing you have to keep in mind is that your current is the same everywhere in a closed current loop. So I've got current that's coming out of my power supply here. It's traveling through these resistors or loads. And those loads could be controllers, PLCs, indicators, sensors, you name it. And then it's coming back into my power supply. But everywhere in that loop, I have the same current. It's all I. Whatever that current happens to be in this loop, it's going to be the same everywhere. What isn't the same is what these voltage drops are. You'll notice I have V1, V2, and V3. So my V total, which is the total voltage I have available to my system, which is from the power supply, is different than the voltage drop I get at each one of these load devices. So the reason why a loop-powered system works is because 
the loop power device doesn't affect the current in the current loop. It may add a voltage drop or a load onto that current loop, but it doesn't in any way change that 4 to 20 milliamp signal that's going around my system. So I can get my power from the voltage drop, and I can read the signal, which is fixed by my transmitter. With an understanding of the, the basic principle, then, of a loop-powered meter, what do they look like? What do they do? Um, some of these things obviously only apply to meters. Some of these will apply to loop-powered devices in general. Um, when you're talking a meter or a display, the most common element is going to be that you've got an LCD display. This is almost always the case because a common theme you're going to hear throughout this webinar is that loop-powered devices are very power-limited. They don't have an external power supply running them, so all of the power that they're using comes from that small voltage drop times that small current. And an LCD is a very low power type of display, so if they have a display, it's almost certainly going to be an LCD. Now, it's got advantages to it. Uh, they're sunlight readable, for example, but it's also got problems, which I'll talk about a bit later. Another common issue with loop-powered devices is that the output options that are available for them are very limited. Generally, they're going to be limited to some kind of passive output, and that takes the form of an open collector transistor, something that functions very much like a relay output might, but it's just a small solid-state transistor as opposed to a larger mechanical relay. So your specifications are going to be much lower for what it can support as far as current or voltage on it. And while you may have an analog output, it's going to be passive. There's just not enough power in a loop power device to drive that 4 to 20 milliamp output with any kind of significant voltage. So if you do have a 4 to 20 out, it's going to require a power supply of its own in order to function. You're going to find that loop power devices have extremely limited serial communication options. If they do have those options, they're going to be fairly slow speed communication or additional power options are going to be required in order to make those work. If you wanted, for example, to have Modbus on a loop-powered device, you may be able to find something that can do it, but it's going to require somewhere in that spec that it have a separate power supply in order to run the Modbus. On the plus side, hazardous area approvals are pretty common on loop-powered devices. Most manufacturers will have either all of their loop power devices approved or um, all of the ones in a particular series, uh, or sometimes they'll have a, a approved version and a non-approved version of the same device. Because loop power devices do have that low power nature, it makes it fairly easy to go and get intrinsically safe and non-incentive approvals on it for use in hazardous areas. So what are those critical specifications you need to know when looking at a loop power device to be able to design your system around it? You've decided that you're okay with the LCD display, you're going to be fine with the passive outputs, um, the idea of loop power being a two-wire device sounds good to you, but you need to know where to get started in terms of looking at that data sheet and making sure you're good to use it. The most important element that's unique to a loop power device that you're going to need to know about is voltage drop. And that is a specification that in some way or another is going to be defined by the data sheet or the instruction manual or the website. It's always going to be talked about. Um, examples of how that voltage drop might appear are listed here. You have like 3.0 volts max. Okay, well that's telling me that my device has a 3 volt maximum drop on that loop. You might see 3 volts at 20 milliamps. Well, the maximum voltage drop is going to occur at the highest current level. So for a 4 to 20 milliamp loop, that means 20 milliamps. So 3 volts at 20 milliamps is telling me the same thing. It's saying I need to account for a 3 volt drop if I'm going to add this device to my current loop. You might see something a little more complicated, like 150 ohm input resistance. Um, they may call it, uh, instead of, I'm sorry, instead of impedance, they may call it equivalent resistance. And in order to calculate that out, then you need to know V equals IR, the standard electrical engineering equation 
So you know your voltage drop is going to be equal to the maximum current going through your loop, which is 0.02 amps. And you need to multiply that by your input impedance, the 150 ohms, and that's going to give you, again, 3 volts. So those are three different ways you might see voltage drop defined that all mean the same thing. This device is going to drop 3 volts off of my loop, and I need to account for that when I'm laying out my system. Now, more complicated devices may have things like lookup tables or charts, but in the end, the question you've got to answer is the same. At 20 milliamps, how much voltage do I need to account for that this device is going to drop in the loop? Now that I know that, in, as with the previous example, let's say it's a 3 volt drop, what do I do with that information? Well, the device voltages in your loop add up to determine the total voltage drop. So if I can go back to my uh, circuit slide for a moment, my V1 is going to add to my V2, and I'm going, it's going to add to my V3, and all three of those together are going to tell me what my total voltage drop is going to be in this loop. And I need to make sure that my power supply, VTOT, is going to be able to provide at least that much voltage, or my circuit's just not going to function. So the power supply must support the cumulative voltage drop of everything in the system. I give you a little written example here just to try to drive that point home. 24 volts is your standard power supply. So let's assume you're using some kind of basic 120 VAC to 24 volt DC power supply. It could be mounted, let's say, on a DIN rail in the back of your enclosure. Well, you plan to use that voltage supply to run a current loop that contains a two-wire radar level transmitter, and that specification tells you that it's going to drop 12 volts to 20 milliamps. You want someone at the bottom of the tank to know what's going on, so you put a loop power display down at grade level, and that specifies that at 20 milliamps it's going to drop 3 volts. To send it back to the control room, you also loop that 4 to 20 milliamp signal through a PLC. In this case, the PLC is externally powered meaning that while it has the 4 to 20 milliamp loop going through it, it's getting its power from a separate connection to it, a separate two wires that probably brings in either 24 volts or 120 AC. In that case, the voltage drop is going to be very insignificant. It's just going to be the sense resistor inside the 4 to 20 milliamp input, which is probably going to bring you around a 0.2 volt drop. So usually if you have a externally powered device like that, you really don't need to worry about the voltage drop on it. So if I add up my 12 volts and my 3 volts and my little bit that I might account for with my PLC, you can see I'm around 15 volts. And that's much less than the 24 volts I have to supply this system. So by doing that quick math, I can see that my power supply can more than support what I have planned for loop powered devices. And in fact, if I wanted to, I could probably add a few more things in here and still be fine. Other critical specifications you need to keep an eye on. The output spec is going to be very important. You may remember when I mentioned the characteristics that you generally only have passive low power outputs here. So that means that your output signals that you're controlling are going to have to be low powered. If I have a open collector output, I may be able to program it just like I could a relay on a different kind of device. And that open collector may be good for a pulse output or a high alarm, a low alarm. I may be able to have it alarm if my flow total reaches a certain level. So it can function very much like that relay. The difference is that a relay is going to be able to support high AC voltages, and it's going to have 3 or 10 amps that can afford to run through it. My open collector output may be limited to the milliamp range and a couple of volts. And that's going to greatly change how I wire my system because now I need to use my open collector output to run some kind of solid state relay that then controls a the device as opposed to just being able to run the power right through my relay. You may also need supplemental devices. If you were counting on that 4 to 20 milliamps, uh, the 4 to 20 milliamp output from a loop power device, well, it's going to be a passive 4 to 20 milliamp output, meaning it needs external power to run. So now I'm talking some kind of power isolator or a second power supply 
in order to run the 4 to 20 milliamp output from my loop power device. So be aware of what the output specifications are and what it means you're going to have to do to work with these loop power devices. Agency approvals is another very common spec that people go to loop power devices in order to get. Uh, you see a couple of the logos here on the right for FM, CSA, ATEX. There's also IEC and others. And uh, loop power devices can very easily be designed to get intrinsically safe or non-incentive approvals on them for class one, div one, class two, div one, et cetera, areas uh, without having to become explosion-proof devices. So if you need those classifications and you can support an intrinsically safe or a non-incentive device, then it provides you with a nice low-cost way to get that approval as opposed to going out and getting something that has to be sealed inside of a, a big aluminum or stainless steel enclosure. And one that I mention, though it's not specific to loop power devices, is the operating temperature range. The reason I bring this up is because, as mentioned earlier, loop power devices will generally use LCDs as their display method. And LCDs, unlike LEDs, are very sensitive to the temperature range. Low temperature affects the liquid in the liquid crystal display that is an LCD. So if you're not careful, you may get a device that doesn't operate in the temperature ranges that you need it to. Your typical LCD is going to stop working somewhere between 0 and minus 20 C. Now, there are some manufacturers, Precision Digital for example, who designs their LCDs specifically to go down to minus 40, but it's by far not the standard. So if you're putting these in places like northern Canada or um, in particularly high elevations where you need to worry about that freezing range of the LCD, uh, you need to make sure that your device is going to support it. Otherwise, you're going to find that your display will freeze. It may go blank. It may start updating so slowly that it just shows eights to someone all the time. It can prove to be a real problem. High temperature isn't typically an issue for LCDs, but it's something that you need to keep an eye on. If you are over, say, 65C, you probably want to keep an eye on what the specs are for your devices to make sure that you're not going to damage the LCD with a high temperature issue either. So we covered a lot of material there. Before we go on any further, um, Ryan, you had a question for the audience. Yeah, so we want to get to know you guys a little bit more and find out what is your primary application? What do you guys usually work with? Uh, so we have a couple of, uh, couple of choices here, pump control, level monitoring, flow, temperature, pressure. What do you usually deal with when it comes to applications? I'm going to give you guys a few more seconds to vote. I see a lot of people are voting. I'll just give it a few more minutes. Once again, pump control, level monitoring, flow, temperature, pressure, or other. And if it is other, you can tell us in the chat too and let us know what it is that, that you work mainly with. So we're going to skip to the results here. And it looks like level monitoring is, is the leading one, well, along with flow uh, and pump control not too far behind. So thanks for voting on that one. Uh, now we're going to move into a question and answer section. Uh, so Joe, I do have one question. Uh, and the question is, can I use the same power supply for my DC powered equipment as I do to run my 4 to 20 milliamp loop? Okay, so if I understand the question properly, what I think is being asked is, if you have a system that is mixed in some kind of line power device and loop power devices, and both are in your system, can you use the same 24 volt supply to run the DC powered devices that require a separate power supply as you do to run the 4 to 20 milliamp loop that is coming out of some transmitter or device and then passing through loop powered devices? And the answer is you probably can, but personally I would suggest against it. If you do that, you have to be very sure that you have devices that are well isolated. And unfortunately, that's not something that a lot of people consider, and it's not something that some manufacturers even specify. And if you don't have strong isolation and you do that, 
then you may open yourself up to ground loop issues or to some strange signal behaviors that are going to be very difficult for you to troubleshoot. So if you're going to mix devices like that, that's perfectly fine, but I'd recommend that you get either a separate power supply or just a, a basic DC to DC isolator of some kind to separate the devices in the loop that need external power supplies that happen to be low voltage DC and the 4 to 20 milliamp loop power supply that's going to run your entire signal loop. So it can be done, but I would recommend that you take steps to isolate it. Sounds good. I do have one more, uh, and this question is from Cliff, and he, has, and he asks, are there higher visibility LCD type options? All right. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by higher visibility, so maybe you could clarify that in the chat box. But if you're asking what are the different types of LCD options, I can talk about that for a bit. Everybody knows that there's such a thing as a very bright touchscreen graphical LCD display, like the kind you have on your smartphone. But those usually require much more power than you get in a loop-powered device. So oftentimes you'll be seeing either your basic segmented LCD, or sometimes you may have a device that has like a, the old dot matrix style LCD display. Those are the two that you're likely to see on a loop power device. Now, you can get devices that have backlights designed to light that up so you can see it in the dark or poorly lit conditions. And usually that backlight will be an option because it's going to add voltage drop to your loop. So if you are up near the max of what your power supply can support, let's say you have a 24 volt transmitter, I'm sorry, let's say you have a 24 volt power supply and you've got an 18 volt two wire level transmitter, well you've only got a few volts to play with now so you may not be able to support a five volt drop device. And that's going to be what the backlights start doing to your loop power devices. It could take a device that's say two volt and make it into a five volt drop device. So there definitely are devices you can get that have brighter backlit LCDs. You just need to be aware of what the voltage drop is going to be like if you use it. Thanks, Joe. I, I think Cliff we have time looks for... Like, oh, if yeah. I could just cut in one second, right? I see Cliff looks sure. like he's clarifying the chat. Um, not black, but uh, on gray, but something else. Really, if you want to get something a little more clear than that with a little more contrast, I think really it's the backlight that you'd be looking for because you can get a device with an amber backlight, a red backlight, green, white. They come in a variety of different colors depending on the manufacturer. And that really does provide more contrast with the black characters. Uh, some manufacturers may even do an inverse LCD, which is a kind of standard as a black or gray. And then instead of the character turning black or gray, the character turns clear so you see the backlight color. So there are some other color and contrast options available, though it tends not to vary too much. All right. Thanks, Joe. Do you think we have time for one more question? Uh, yeah, I think we do. All right. So Patrick asks, what happens if the total drop is equal to the power supply? So what you'll find drop. is as your total voltage drop approaches the power supply, you're going to find that the first thing you're going to realize is that the power supplies are never exactly what they say they're going to be. So I may have a 24-volt power supply, but once I start putting loads on it, depending on the quality of the power supply, it may drop down from 25 to 24. It may drop down from 24 to 23 and a half. Um, you want to always leave yourself some headroom there. Uh, I'd suggest at least, say, 10%. So if you have a 24-volt power supply, I wouldn't try to go beyond, say, 21 volts, maybe 22 volts. Uh, otherwise, you run the risk of having problems. What will happen as you start to exceed what your power supply can support is you're not going to have enough power available to run your loop. So your current that is being required to be pumped by the transmitter, let's say your transmitter is saying push 12 volts, it's going to start to, I'm sorry, push 12 milliamps. You're going to find that your 12 milliamps is going to start to fail and collapse. And it'll usually happen pretty quickly. So instead of having 12 milliamps, it's trying to power up all these loop power devices. It can't do it. 
it can't get any more power available, and so the only thing left to happen is that your milliamps are going to drop. And generally, you're, you're going to start seeing devices fail. You're going to see your milliamp values drop, possibly even below 4 milliamps. Um, and it's going to look like there's some kind of serious wiring or device problem, when in reality, it's just that you don't have enough input power into this loop to keep it going. And so if you see that that's happening, if you see, especially as your, your transmitter output increases as you go from 4 milliamps to 10 milliamps to 18 milliamps to 20 milliamps, if you see at those higher levels that your devices are starting to fade, your LCDs are going blank, your milliamp loop can't quite make it over a certain level without the uh, milliamp values fluctuating wildly and some other devices starting to behave odd, that's probably a sign that your power supply just can't support your system. All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, that's all the questions we have for right now, but we do have one more question and answer section coming up, uh, so feel free to uh, submit those questions to Don in the chat, and we'll read those later on. So when is a loop-powered device your best choice? Uh, you've obviously been hearing me talk a lot about the problems of them and the limitations of them, but let's take a second to consider why people use them to begin with. One of the best pros is that Loop-powered devices are simple and easy-to-use devices that get a display or some other element of your 4 to 20 milliamp loop accomplished. If I have a two-wire level transmitter, I don't need to run power to the top of my tank. I can wire it up extremely easily with just the two wires for the signal. If I want to add a display at the bottom of my tank, I don't need to bring power there. I can just splice this display in to the route I've already got planned for my 4 to 20 milliamp line. It's very easy to wire them in, attach them later, without having to do a lot of reconfiguration and, and conduit runs, etc. They're nice and easy to work with. Because they don't have a lot of internal power supply electronics, and because they don't have a lot of high power outputs, they tend to be fairly low cost solutions. There's just not a lot of electronics or features to support on them that make them more expensive. And they're a great option for people who are looking for intrinsically safe or non-incentive hazardous area approvals. Because a lot of manufacturers could get those approvals on loop power devices because of their just natural low power nature. You have to keep those cons in mind as well though. They're only going to work in those situations where you're able to use those limited output options. And because they're low power, you're not going to get the relays. You're not going to get an LED display if that's what's in the spec. You're not going to be able to have a powered 4 to 20 loop coming out of this to retransmit it to somewhere else. But if you're OK with those limitations, then there are some definite pros. The largest con is that you've got to make sure that your voltage drop and your power supply considerations are met. You don't want to go installing these and then have to try to troubleshoot what the problem is and be waiting on another delivery of a 36-volt power supply because you didn't add up your voltage drops and realize that the 24-volt power supply wasn't going to be enough. So that's, that's one of the biggest upfront calculations you've got to make. Even if you're just looking to use some simple displays or one simple two-wire transmitter. So to illustrate when it can be your best choice, why don't we take a look at the application photo we've got here, which is a real-world example that was sent in by one of Precision Digital customers. This was being used in a tank farm, and they had a need for remote level displays for oil tanks. You can, of course, always just walk up the side of your tank and take a look at what the level is. Uh, there's mechanical ways you can do that, but oftentimes as well, you have the level transmitter itself at the top of the tank that shows you how much is in there. But people often don't want to climb to the top of the tanks, obviously, and so they try to put that information somewhere else, somewhere where an operator can see it more close to where it's being pumped out of or at grade level on the ground next to the tank where someone's likely to walk by. It saves you time, it's much safer, and more and more, uh, there's even requirements of plants to change over to that kind of a display. The problem is the plant was already built. The tanks were already in. 
and power was not something that was being run through any of these conduit lines. The installation was also outdoors and in a hazardous area. So now if they do have to do a lot of rework, they're shutting down their plant. They need to make sure whatever they put in there is going to be sunlight readable. And if you add all of these concerns up, it turns into a tricky little application to solve for them. Their solution was a loop-powered indicator. They have an explosion-proof system set up. So in order to not have to use barriers, etc., they got a loop-powered device that was in an explosion-proof enclosure. The advantage of using a loop-powered indicator of it, rather than, say, a, a line-powered device that could go in an explosion-proof enclosure we put into the area, is that now they can display the 4 to 20 milliamp signal showing level on a nice feet and inches display like you see there in the photo, and they don't have to run power lines anywhere. All they have to do is cut into that 4 to 20 line that's already going back to some control room somewhere and tie it into this, these two devices. So they don't need to bring out power. They can put the display anywhere they want along the 4 to 20 milliamp run, and all they have to do is just wire the two wire up the two wires of their two wire slash loop power device, and they're done. A little bit of programming later, and their their system was complete. Now they have a location where you can see both tanks, clearly labeled in feet and inches on the ground, with very minimal disruption to the plant due to the installation. So that's a great example of where you might see explosion proof devices that are loop powered being valuable, both because they're explosion proof, and that's what the plant standardized on but the loop-powered nature of it makes it a great choice for this easy installation. So what are the criteria that might have prevented someone from using loop power? Where not only is loop power maybe not your best choice, but where you simply can't find a loop-powered solution to meet your need? Well, if the specification for the plant or the project requires an LED or some kind of advanced full-color cell phone-like display, you're not going to find that in a loop powered device. It's just the power demands on that kind of a display are too great to be supported. Anytime you've got high power output requirements like relays or a self powered 4 to 20, again, there's just not enough power to provide it, those kinds of outputs. And when an external power supply is required in the transmitter or really anywhere else, you've got to ask yourself is it worth using loop powered here? So if I know that my transmitter, for example, has to have a separate 24 volt input, well now I've got 24 volts coming out to my site. I've got it nearby, potentially. Is it close enough that I might as well just use 24 volt powered equipment everywhere just to keep things simpler? And that's a consideration that's going to be based really on your individual application. If your power supply is inside of the same enclosure as everything else, maybe you don't have to worry about loop power devices. Get your some bright LED displays, get relay powered in there, get 4 to 20 milliamp powered outputs, because why not? You've got a 24 volt supply ready to be used right there in your cabinet. Other things to keep in mind, if you start hearing about high power requirement serial communications, things like Modbus, for example, then you know that loop power is not going to be for you. If you're in extremely low temperature environments, you can use loop power devices, but you've got to make sure that you can find what you're looking for. Some extremely low cost versions uh, just aren't going to be able to cut it. You're going to end up with frozen displays, and nobody wants to have someone out there in minus 30 trying to figure out why their display is not working. And then the most obvious one, if you don't have a 4 to 20 milliamp loop current, Loop power devices specifically work with 4 to 20 milliamp signal loops. If you're trying to send a pulse output or trying to read an RTD or trying to check temperature with a thermocouple, then you're not yet in the 4 to 20 milliamp world and loop power is not going to be an option for you. Now, if those go to a transmitter, something that converts the pulse to a 4 to 20 or the RTD to a 4 to 20, you can certainly find two wire devices that will do that. But if you're just looking for something that will take in a thermocouple, there's no 4 to 20 milliamp device or 4 to 20 milliamp loop there, so there is no loop power device to be had. At that point, you're really just trying to simplify things with, say, a battery powered temperature indicator. 4 to 20 milliamp loops are required for loop powered devices. So, in summary, what did we go over? 
We talked about the definitions and characteristics of loop-powered devices, the terms you're going to need to be familiar with and what kind of characteristics they tend to have. We talked about the critical specifications for loop power, things like you need to be able to calculate the voltage drop. You need to be aware of what your outputs can support. We talked about when you would want to use loop power, and we talked about when you wouldn't want to use loop power and instead go to something else. And before we get to our last Q&A, Ryan, you've got one more question. I do. So we want to ask how often you uh, specify digital displays. Uh, now, if you answer you specify them a lot, you're not going to get a call from us. This is just kind of to gauge uh, who in our audience uses precision digital products. Just uh, something unique for us to learn. So how often do you specify digital displays? One to two times per year, three to ten times per year, at least once per month, or never? Uh, so I'll give everyone a couple of seconds to take that poll, and then we will move on to our last Q&A. So it looks like everyone is pretty much voting here. So it looks like mostly three to ten times per year, uh, one to two or once a month. Only very few of you never do, which is good. Uh, so we're going to move on to our last Q&A section, and, and I have one question for you, Joe. Now, uh, why is loop-powered uh, a better choice than line-powered when it comes to hazardous areas? Okay. There's two answers to that question, or two parts to the answer. The first is that a loop-powered device only drops a little voltage on the loop and is limited to a 4 to 20 milliamp current supply. So they naturally just don't have a lot of power to work with. That's the same requirement or, or same type of requirement that a non-incentive or an um, intrinsically safe device has. Intrinsically safe and non-incentive devices are approved because they have so little power in them at any given time, they can't possibly cause combustion. There's just not enough energy there to ignite something. And so if you're already designing a device that's loop-powered and is designed to be low-power, well, you can also design it such that it's so, got so little instantaneous power in it that it meets the requirements for non-incentive and intrinsic safety. So in other words, uh, manufacturers can, I don't want to say easily, but with, with some effort, but easier than other ways of getting approvals, they can turn their loop-powered devices into approved hazardous area devices. And now you've got this easy-to-install, fairly low-cost has this area approved device. The other reason that loop power devices are good for hazardous areas is because if you have an area where explosion proof devices are preferred, you can still use loop power because of their ease of setup, because it's so easy to mechanically build them into your system. Uh, like that example we looked at, you don't have to worry about running out various different power supplies out there or having additional conduits that are going to carry those because you've just got your two wires for the signal. It's less installation cost. It's less time plumbing this up. It's less conduit. Um, it's less confusion between what wires are what. So even if you're in an explosion-proof environment, simplifying the installation like that has a big benefit. So I guess just to quickly summarize that answer, a loop power device can get you either a nice low cost hazardous area solution if non-incentive and intrinsic safety is possible for your application, or they can reduce costs and complexity of your explosion proof uh, devices as well. So really no matter which way you're looking at it, you're going the non-incentive route, intrinsically safe route, or explosion proof route, a loop power device brings something to all those solutions that a line power device doesn't. All right, thanks, Joe. That's all the questions that I have. If you guys have any other questions um, and you think of them after this webinar, maybe when you watch uh, w when you watch the link when it's sent out, uh, you can always email us. Uh, and speaking of that, we want to hear from you. So we want you to help uh, us choose our next webinar topics. You can email myself, Ryan Shea, at rshea at predig com, um, and pretty much we want to hear about any topics that you want discussed from 4 to 20 milliamp loop questions in industrial communications, daily difficulties that you m maybe would like to see addressed. Um, and the good thing is, is that if you have that 
If you have that difficulty, I'm sure other people do too and would like to see a webinar on it. Also, uh, instrumentation and control terminology, difficult uh, with, with hazardous location equipment, and uh, any sort of feedback that you have for us based on the webinars. And also, this webinar is brought to you by Precision Digital, uh, and we're helping you become more proficient with process signals, connections, and communications. And we hope to be your source for loop-powered meters, digital panel meters, ha hazardous area instruments, large display meters, and more. And of course, if you guys have any questions, uh, you can always email us or give us a call. Uh, but we thank you for joining this webinar, and we'll see you at the next one. Have a great day.